Welcome to the Next Level Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Dickinson. The following is an interview with Dr. Kevin Pierce, chiropractor and senior director of medical clinics with the USA Olympic Committee. Here's your opportunity to peer into Team USA, preparations for the Olympic Games, and working on the medical team for these amazing athletes. It's an eye-opening interview, and I hope you enjoy. Kevin, welcome to the Next Level Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Scott, thanks for having me. I'm excited today to see, you know, what we uncover and what we discuss. So thanks for having me. I want to start with a very important question, something that always teaches me a lot about my patients or a person as I get to know them. Uh, the question is, if you're going to only eat one meal for the rest of your life, it's going to be the same food on the same plate every day, every meal, what would this meal be? So I'll ask a clarifying question. How large is this plate? The it's place is like, as large as you need it to be. It's going to be a large plate. Uh, first and foremost, tortillas on the base of that. I can wrap a anything in a tortilla. So I'll stick with a tortilla base the size of the plate. Um, I enjoy meat. So it'd probably be heavy beef related in some capacity, probably multiple layers of beef. Um multiple layers of beef yeah, layers it's not going to be like it's not going to be single layer this is yeah, uh yeah. something that i'll try to wrap but it'd probably be just end up being just a, a mess each meal um <laughs> meat cheese i'm pretty basic if it's got bacon on it too so you gotta have some pork in there uh i can eat a breakfast burrito probably any part of the day so it's kind of be probably breast breakfast burrito-esque mm, cheese. some egg on there egg sausage heavy meat base. And then I do like veggies. This is kind of be weird because I don't put this in the typical breakfast burrito, but I think if I'm looking at a veggie, not really, it's more of a, uh, a squash, more of a, um, zucchini. That's pretty much it. Yeah. I probably could eat that every single day in some capacity and there's a variety of cheeses. So I have, I have a, a chance to mix and match meat, cheese, veggie combo, still right. a tortilla. Yeah. I guess you do, but you're really flirting with the rules there. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so can you tell people what you do for the U.S. Olympic team? So for someone who doesn't know, has never met you, wh what do you say? Um, so I'm part of the healthcare team when it comes to Team USA. So we have a broad team. Currently, my role's changed over the years, and maybe we talk on that more later. But it's uh, right now, I currently oversee three of our training clinics. Um, and so a lot of that is just the day-to-day -day operations when it comes to how our medical clinics function, whether it be staff related policies, procedures, programs are running, um, a variety of things across our team and our professional development side of things, as well as just, um, leading the leaders of those clinics. Um, you know, how do we manage care similarly across clinics? So if an athlete came to one of our sites, we would have similar one staff, opportunities as far as equipment and things we have, but also just the, the style of which that we, that we practice um, is a big part of my day. Yeah. And then I think if I took that a step further, it's going to be integrating outside of our teams that are basically our medical team that is, that is team USA. Um, that's broader than that would be integrating with those staff medical uh, and the such of the, the teams that we work with. And so those would be NGBs in our mind. So it'd be basically um, the sports uh, and the sport teams and the sports medicine teams that are involved in those programs. NGBs for those who don't know? Uh, NGBs are national governing bodies. So national governing bodies would be uh, each sport. So track and field is a national governing body. Swimming, gymnastics. Um, you look at any Olympic sport specifically, and they're, they're their own little NGB under the umbrella of the Olympic, um, Olympic and Paralympic umbrella. And so we have Olympic and Paralympic uh, NGBs. And that's the, those are the teams that we kind of, we help support. Okay. Gotcha. Now, has your role recently changed? Were you uh, previously more so in patient care and now more in management or how has it evolved? I think if you look at our team, so it's evolved, no doubt. Um, when I first came into Team USA, uh, really it was just a volunteer part and it was volunteering time with different NGBs that were looking for healthcare providers when we weren't quite as robust as, as Team USA is now. Um, and then it's transitioned to a full-time position. So I've been with Team USA since 2012. Uh, 2012 was when I moved over from private practice into full-time uh, Team USA care. And so I managed at that time, just a healthcare provider within our clinic system based in San Diego. 
over the years, it has transitioned. And so there, I took on a little bit different role of managing the clinic down in San Diego and working with a team that was just specifically in that area, but integrating with our teams that cross our three training centers. Um, and then took on a little bit of a more expanded role where it was across Southern California and it was integrating with different teams that are um, I'm South, Southern California based. And so hotbed for, for Team USA and Olympic sport and Paralympic sport is Southern California. Uh, a large contingency of our Olympic teams, either born and raised in California or they train out in the area. And so we have a, a, a large number of team sports as well as individual sports, uh, individual athletes that do train in the area. And so it was expanding the services outside of our clinics and in working with uh, some of our tier and higher profile teams and, and, and athletes in the area and just kind of providing medical services and being a liaison to our broader national medical network, as well as our medical network of physicians, PTs, ATs, doesn't matter what discipline you throw in there um, to integrate with them. And so it's kind of transitioned from that then into the role now where I oversee three clinics and do a similar role uh, and still have a clinical hat where I get to work in patient care as well with some of the stuff that I do in Southern California, as well as across our clinics. So it has been moved gradually into the administrative side, but there's still a heavy um, clinical aspect, I'd say. Okay. So you said back in 2012 was when you first started with them, correct? Correct. You said USA Olympics, uh, perhaps like the medical reinforcements have improved or grown over the years. Can you, can you talk us through like what's changed? Cause in my mind, it, it it's like, you know, we're team USA. We, we got to have a hundred chiropractors, a hundred PTs, 300 athletic trainers on staff, right? Like, so can you talk us through how that's evolved? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's evolved heavily internally. And it's like, we can use the Olympic team itself and we continually to, we continue to just broaden our skills. And so traditionally the models have been, you know, like through the years, they've kind of, they've changed where there's more of a interdisciplinary team. And so we have probably had that previously. Um, but as far as how people were, you know, structured as far as contracts and things. And so we have full-time staff now based at all of our clinics where uh, traditionally maybe prior, it would have been a lot of volunteers. And so we had PTs athletic trainers, chiropractors, massage therapists, physicians working with our teams, um, but maybe not in the role where they were full-time staff. And so over the years, since 2012, um, we had that when I came in, I was part of that transition where we were implementing chiropractors to our medical teams. We had some at not all of our training centers at the time, but I we had one already in San Diego. And so I was joining as an additional set of hands based off a of skill set and some of our training, which is a little bit different than just chiropractic specifically. Um, and we already had a PT and AT. And so we we're kind of diversifying. We we're definitely diversifying our team and all of our training centers. We've since broadened that even further. Um, and we still have ATs, PTs, DCs. Most of our staff are dual credentials. So we have a PT, AT, um, a, a DC that's an EMT. We have, um, you know, a variety of, we have a DC that's an acupuncturist. And so now we're much broader as far as who is, you know, our USOPC, so US Olympic and Paralympic Committee's medical team. Uh, we also have a chief medical officer, which is different than previously, and he's a DO. Um, we have a PA. We have massage therapy that's full time now, and so we had all these things previously. So it's not a not drastically different, but as far as full time staff, mm -hmm. um, we are much larger than we were before. And then, not to mention that we have a whole mental health team where we previously had, you know, sports psychology doing mental health and and vice versa, and kind of wearing two hats around sports psychology as well as the mental health side of things. Well, now we have a whole mental side, uh, mental health team inside of the house, and so with our dietitian strength coaches, it's a broader team. And so I, I, I'm going to miss some here if someone ever watched this and they'd be like, oh, you <laughs> sports physiology, I'm trying to cover all my bases, but our medical team is broader than just um, what maybe people consider as medical. Um, and it's truly the performance and medicine side kind of hopefully merged into one. So you mentioned that you got into USA Olympics through starting as a volunteer, right? And uh, what's funny is, um, a colleague that, that you know, Heather Linden, who is the director of physical therapy for the UFC, she said the same thing. She started uh, volunteering with the U.S. Olympic team, and that's how she got her first job with the uh, with the Olympic team. So uh, I'm noticing a trend here. Did you guys come in at the same time? And like, is that how a lot of these uh, early hires got in? I think I think so. Heather and I were around the same time, so I've known Heather quite some time now. Um, it's amazing what she's done and how she's transitioned to the UFC. So it's it's awesome for. Uh, for her and just display her skills a different way. So I'm really proud for her. Um, but I think we came in around the same time. I couldn't remember and I couldn't tell you 
if she was before I was in there, I mean, we just didn't have, it was a different time where you look at now with Zoom and all the other capabilities. Like we definitely had staff meetings across our clinics, but I don't think we were as tight as we were now. Had that been different when Heather and I started, I probably have a better exact time of when she started. If I came in before her, et cetera, or after, um, but I do know that a lot of our team has come from the volunteer side of things. And we still have that side of the house where we we bring in volunteers that help support our team and broaden our skills when it comes to just like what we're doing and how we're practicing, but also just the hands that we have during heavy volume. Since we're still pretty lean as a, as a medical team, since we have three different clinics uh, that we support and the teams that come through there, it's challenging with the, you know, the staff that we have, whether it be administrative staff or um, clinicians specifically. And so the volunteer network is a big part of how we, you know, recruit one. Mm -hmm. It's also how we help NGB. So other sports recruit their providers too. So you probably see a very, a a strong trend across, uh, all of team USA medical, when it be NGBs, USOPC, et cetera, from this volunteer network, it's a big way to get in. And it's pretty much, how do you, how do you establish yourself? Right. Or how do you get your name known? And how do you just understand the inner workings of an organization like the US Olympic committee? Yeah. You hear that students, you got to start working for free, but then you could be working with team USA. Uh, you start working for free and then you start working for cheaper whenever you <laughs> <laughs> start giving away services, but that's actually, if you enjoy what you do, it's not a big deal. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, all right. So we have, as a, as a, as a country, we have three training facilities. Is that correct? So we have three training center. We have two training centers, one training site, but all that are under the umbrella of Team USA, so the U.S. Olympic Committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are multiple training centers or training sites, rather, excuse me, training sites across the U.S. um, that maybe someone like wrestling goes to or USA rowing or they may have like a designated training site that's uh, affiliated with U.S. Olympic teams um, and Paralympic teams. Um, but three training training centers that are run and operated by the U.S. Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committee. Gotcha. And then what what are the main sports coming out of California where you guys are down in Chula Vista? Yeah, California is a mixed bag. So we have a number of, I mean, traditionally we're a summer sport location. Uh, we do have sports, rugby, men's and women's rugby is out there, USA Archery. We have, it's a giant facility. Um 300 acres of, of land where there's just a lot of team outdoor sports. We have a number of soccer fields there. It's a huge facility. Um, so we do get camps that come through that are USA soccer based. Um, we have camps come through from, you know, cycling disciplines, whether it be on the Olympic or Paralympic side or more of our freestyle super cross BMX mm. um, volleyball courts out there. So we get USA volleyball comes out. So there's a number of teams, but predominantly summer sports that come through there. I think I mentioned the majority of USA rowing. There's a lake out there too. So USA rowing mm-hmm. comes out or canoe kayak, but um, majority are summer sports out in the SoCal area. And then if it's, you know, in weather, other areas, maybe this time of year where it's nice to come out to sunny California, we might have some, some winter sport teams come out if the, right before they train so they can, you know, use a weight room and use a track. I see. And I see. Things they can do with outdoors still with, with less rain and, and more sunshine. Now, when you guys, as a medical staff, when you guys hear that they're adding more sports to the Olympic Games, does that give you pause or worry? Like, how are we going to keep managing all these athletes? Or like, is that something that's, is is it like getting double booked on your schedule? You're like, oh man, I have even more patients and I'm I'm already drowning. Is it that kind of feeling? Or you guys happy when sports get added on? I think it's amazing when sports get added on. It's so cool to see you know, and learn new aspects of example being USA breaking coming in to the Olympic games for Paris in 2024. Um, it's breaking, whole, like break dancing. Yeah. That's yeah, coming. There's four, there's four new disciplines. That'll be a part of the, um, the Olympic games in 2024 and USA breaking is one of them or break dancing is one of them. So it's different than maybe how, uh, we grew up with cardboard and, and head spins. If you look at the athleticism that's around there and the, and the the body awareness and skills, it's really impressive. So I think when you have a sport like that coming in or the last games you saw in 2021, 2022, 2020, 2021 with softball and baseball back in, like there's cycles where some, some sports come in and out um, mm-hmm. of different games. And it's, it's exciting to see just the athleticism that they have and the things they bring, but the crossover that is within, um, you know, certain sports and not to say someone, maybe gymnastics is more of a crossover, but different things and, and common injuries and things you see across different sports that you wouldn't have thought of just based off of, um, you know, applied or basic skills that were learned from maybe 
early mm-hmm. adolescent sports. But yeah, USA Breaking is one of them uh, that'll be in the next Olympic Games. And another example that'll be out there is, is rock climbing. And so sport climbing, which is, I mean, what am I, I first time I saw it was at the Olympic Games. We had to say there are little pieces, but truly watched it. Amazing to watch bouldering, amazing to watch speed climbing, just the things that they can do. Um, but that'll be back in 24. So it's a, it's a good example of how 2020, 2020 brought it in and then it stayed in for 2024. So it should be pretty cool. Yeah. You, you, to answer your question, I don't actually think about like <laughs> it being burdens more like this is fascinating and this is like really cool for us to, you know, take another little mindset or take some experience from something else and apply it to, you know, a new and interesting way because the team and the, the, the sport demands are different. Right. Right. And if for people who haven't seen uh, rock climbing, specifically speed climbing, it is unbelievable because it looks like these people are, are moving like across the ground. They're flying so fast, but they're actually going straight up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like a series of uh, the same patterning of holds and they literally are running straight up in the air and it's, it's remarkable. So that, that's so cool. That you got to see that. Uh, don't you think it's funny? I don't know that I could go this way as fast as they're going this way. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. 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 So Kevin was <laughs> saying, I don't think that I could stand and, and, and go as quick as they're going. It's kind of funny. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And, um, What's cool about rock climbing too is that for the Olympics, they asked the the same climber to be good at three different disciplines of climbing, which is kind of like a, being a decathlete in track and field because normally they're so specialized as rock climbers, like it's just bouldering and that's their thing. But to have to do all three is a totally different way of climbing for the average person. Yeah, I think they're going to do it different this next games because that was more of the the initial state. I believe next games will have two separate disciplines. And so you have a bouldering and you have a speed event. Um, and I'm not quite sure the crossover there. I don't know enough of the inner workings from, uh, yeah, yeah. From climbing. But I just know I've heard that they're separating the two, but the initial in in uh, Japan was going to be, a, it was a, was a mix, which is, yeah, you're right. It's like a decathlete. It's like, it's a multi, it's like basically like a triathlon, right? Or anything, something else where you're doing two right. things really well. <laughs> right. Right. So I, I can tell you from like the, uh, the grassroots rock climbing community, I have a couple of friends involved and, and they were like poo pooing the idea that you had to be good at all three because normally it's so specialized towards one or the other. Right. So very interesting. And then skateboarding. Yeah. Of course. Skateboarding, I believe is back in. Um, and that's awesome. I mean, it just does. And maybe it's awesome because that's how I grew up. I grew up in Southern California and BMX skateboarding and those things were, you know, just a part of culture, I'd say, um, a different capacity. And so to see that, you know, having an opportunity in a stage, just, it's, it's pretty awesome for the sport. So for sure. For yeah. sure. So what is, um, what was treating like through over the years working with these different athletes? Uh, would they would they stay at your facility for months and months on end and you'd get to know them really well? Would they be transient and bouncing around and you just kind of meet them, treat them as needed, and then they're off on their way? What kind of, what kind of relationships did you get to build? Uh, so it's a mixture of both. A lot of the camps. And so if you're at a training center specifically, it is very much, you know, resident life. And so they they live, they, they live, you know, just near their training facility on campus there. They have, accommodations as far as food and things accessed uh, where they can access on campus and they're living there full time and they're training, you know, with their heart towards that next either world cup world event. Hopefully they're going to transition to a Pan American games or pair Pan American games to look at Pan American games. So um, they're living on site. You get to know them really well. Uh, It's very much like that college atmosphere, I would say, just Mm because based off just not in a bad way necessarily, but almost like dorm life Um, because they're living in more of like a dorm typically setting um, if they're at all of our three training centers. And so they're living on campus, they eat, breathe and sleep at that location. Right. Um, and they know and they get to know other sports really well. And they have a lot of crossover as far as like shared experience and things. So it's really cool from like the camaraderie and respect aspect of, you know, sport and the growth of sport. But from a medical side of things, we see them all the time. And so they're on campus. We know when they have, like, when they're sick, they come and see our staff. When they have something that's bugging them from, you know, a family issue or other things that are happening in their life outside of where they're training, we see all of that. And so I say it's more like that college dorm room setting because everyone's involved and it's a big, Mm. it's a a large place, but a very small community. Sure. So from a treatment side of things, you're treating them for everything. I mean, we're a big part of their medical team and we rely on resources outside to, to help us in, in some of those more difficult cases. Um, but we are there, um, you know, that day-to-day 
in and out of them popping in just to say hi because they just need they just want to chat with somebody. So it's fun. Yeah. When you have a chiropractor on staff, a physical therapist on staff, an athletic trainer on staff, and they could see any one of you guys, how do you guys figure out who they're going to be working with, how much they're working with who, that kind of thing? It's really a mixture. And so if you looked at our clinic floor across all of our disciplines, you probably wouldn't know who's who just mm-hmm. on the outside. So you walk into clinic, you see people treating and managing care, you wouldn't know. I think we pride ourselves on that. You wouldn't know who's an AT, who's a who's a PT, who's a DC, just mm-hmm. based off of skills. Cause I think part of the fun, part of the fun is that we continue to upskill each other in different aspects from whether it be soft tissue mobilization techniques. Um, you may know the difference between that it may be a PT or a, a, a DC because so, someone's manipulating somebody, right? But when it comes to the soft tissue manual skills, you probably wouldn't know who's who. Mm. And in our case in, in, in Southern California and all of our locations are a little bit different rehab area. If you got in the rehab area, you probably have a hard time understanding who's who's the physical therapist in that group based off of just the, the crossover. And so answering your question, the athlete really gets to choose who they drive with. Mm-hmm. Um, and who they really have a good experience with from a personal connection, whether they're, or their skills and things they're looking for on the back end, our team's being upskilled on everything. And so it's the grand rounds that we do with, um, you know, on athlete specific cases among our team, it's the upskilling we do as far as continuing education. Um, it's really just that performance mindset with medicine involved of how we manage behind the scenes of things that need to be done. And so if they prefer to be with me or somebody else. It's not an ego trip in that mind in, in the clinic there because everyone's there for the right goal, which is the cool and maybe unique setting. Um, and the athlete wants to work with said person. Well, they're going to get a little bit of input from, you know, the DC, the PT, the AT, the MT of things that are going on and maybe things we should consider in their general plan. With that, we have performance team and strength conditioning coaches we integrate with too. And so, um, you know, so-and-so might have some, you know, early, you know, general preparation exercises that we're, we're using in medicine uh, before we get them into the, as we start transitioning. So you probably wouldn't know who's who uh, the athlete gets to choose kind of who they want to work with. And oftentimes they don't know really who's who um, just, because they know, they get soft tissue, they do rehab with that person. And then, and they know them as a, as a person rather than their specialty. Now, do some people's like caseloads build up? Like oh, absolutely. more than others like, Hey, I need to offload you to this. <laughs> I was going to say like, you know, absolutely. cause I know athletes somewhat, I guess. And, you know, if, if one person really likes X person, then X person is going to get a lot more traffic if that athlete's doing well. You know what I mean? So how, how does that all play out? Yeah, I think it's a, it is a dynamic that we we deal with it on, on a regular basis. And I think um, part of our approach within the, like our performance meetings at each one of our locations is, is trying to uh, keep a lot of people you know, in the know of what's happening. And so we can partner on certain cases. And so I mentioned that you might not know who's in our clinics and, you know, what, what specialties, what, but we do have, you know, specialties that we do work with. And so if we can partner on our approach and partner in, uh, you know, I'm, this person's really good at soft tissue techniques, but you're going to get, you know, some type of mobilization today. And then this person's going to, you know, do your rehab. And we try to just frame it that it's a team approach and we work as we work well as a team um, that, yes, I know you like said person, but their bandwidth is this. And mm. we have three other good providers. It's, it's, it's almost education really and communication with that. We're not passing you off. We're actually integrating our team because their skill is better than mine. I know you think mine may be good or so-and-so's may be good, but that's actually their wheelhouse. Mm. and you should probably be paired with them because that's the best person for you. Mm. And there's obviously going to be conflict as far as personality and things and whatever else, the dynamics that happen. But it's a, it's a, it's a spin on that, I would say, is um, we have definitely clinicians that are heavily loaded and their bandwidth is low and people know that. So that demand is there, right? Even if they don't even know them at all, like who's the busiest? I want to see them. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's just framing it. It's framing it and leaning on the, leaning on the skill sets that people truly have in that particular discipline. Very good. Do athletes have to schedule blocks to come in or is it more like athletic training room style free for all? It used to be old school way when we first started. And I, I think when I first started, it was still moving, moving away from that, but it is very much, you know, appointment based uh, when it comes to the maintenance, the schedule, of like post-op cases, things of that sort but acute trauma happens across our training centers and in and, and any location. And we're in a unique setting where we don't athletes don't pay for services that they have access to us. And so we're going to get an acute ankle that comes through, or, you know, someone has a soft tissue injury 
and we we work on the fly and we, we partner as a team to shift things. And oftentimes athletes appreciate that when they see somebody come, you know, carry, hobbling, in or... hobbling in or carrying in, but they're on the table for some maintenance stuff. A lot of times they'll, you know, they realize that there's other goals for others so that they can, they can move theirs, so they can push theirs down the road a little bit. That's good. Not always. Depends on time of year, but <laughs> <laughs> if you're not competing for another three and a half years, you're probably more lenient. And there's so many there. I mean, cause there's so much more than just the Olympic side of sport and people know that the Olympics happen every two years, right. Between winter and summer games, but there's Pan American games between those two as well. And then there's world cup events that happen and there's their general training that they're happening to make their world mark so they can, you know, make it to trials if they have a trials, you know? So all those things are happening at the inner workings throughout the year that everyone's kind of competing for. Um, fortunately, unfortunately that people only know about the Olympics when they happen on TV and things, but those, all the work that happens for that quad or every four years, um, there's a lot going into the competitions that happen between there that our team are helping them kind of ho- hopefully achieve. So yeah, there's always someone who's training for something and they're, but they're also willing to, you know, see that there's a, maybe not a teammate for somebody else that's in more, more appropriate need. But need. Like you got yeah. a bone sticking out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a, you said the quad. So the four year cycle of the Olympics, um, how long is the longest uh, an athlete would be in a quiet time? Like, or is it like two years of just training and preparation before the first uh, trials kind of thing? I'm sure it's sport dependent, but uh, what what is the average Olympic athlete? What does the four year cycle look like? That's a really good question. It's probably hard for us to map out because we see yeah. a variety of sports that you know have different disciplines. I think if you ask a track coach, you're building throughout that entire that entire quad, um, and maybe something more of an endurance sport, similar thing where you're building your cardiac um, compa- your cardiac capacity as you're working through you know the early phases of the year um, of the initial part of the quad through. So I think it really, it's sport dependent. Um, the lifespan, and I would say not to say lifespan, but the longevity for, you know, certain sports is really pretty, it's pretty thin um, it based off of if there's a, if there's a collegiate, um, I mean, if there's a heavily collegiate influence, whether it's, let's say I continue using track and field as an example, because they're, I mean, we have all the NCAA track and field athletes that make, team usa in that particular discipline and there's a lot of sports that are very similar to that not just to highlight one where there's a it's a like a feeder system through the ncaa and so um they're training maybe not through the quad through their season because they're you know competing at their particular um conference championship and things and they're going to make the olympic team or the you know make team usa may not olympic team team usa world championship team or, or something more similar um and so it's not really tough to outline that i don't know if i can answer that question specifically yeah. I, yeah. The lifespan's short, right? The, the duration of time for a lot of people is, is a small window. And I say lifespan, meaning like there's a window, it's small um, for so many. But then other sports have the capacity uh, to go to multiple Olympic Games, go through multiple quads based off of, you know, what the sport demands. Right. Right. I, I guess I, as a, as a novice or a newbie to the Olympic world, I, I guess I just picture right after the Olympic games, everyone's kind of like twiddling their thumbs and, and like looking at the calendar for four years from now and then uh, how, how things progress from there. Um, but anyway, uh, well, what... I, there's a good point there and I can, maybe I can highlight that a little more. So yeah. after the Olympic games, like there's still the next quad has started for so many, whether they fell short um, and, and making that, you know, olympic or paralympic team um but that next that happened in the summertime they may take that next three months or so off and then coming in november and then in the let's say it's a summer sport athlete they may start doing some base and general preparation in october november take some time off for the holidays and then january one new quad they're in right back at it they're right back at it partly for that, for the quad duration where they're going to continue, you know, if someone stopped after Tokyo, it's different because it moved to 21. Right. Um, but if they're going to continue to push through that quad, they have four years to make the Olympic team. Right. But they have a lot of steps within the way where they need to, you know, make Olympic standards. They need to, you know, remain healthy. Let's say at that point still, or, or, you know, get back from maybe, um, something that set them back, but they have a number of markers they need to choose to make their international teams um, that help them, you know, on the world standards that help them compete internationally that aren't Olympic stage. I mean, they're Olympic caliber, but not the Olympics um, help them compete through those. 
mm. events that carry them through the first year, second year, third year. And then if there's a trial or something else, they make them to the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. Tell me about being overseas somewhere in the world for the Olympic Games. Like, like bring us there. What, what's it like being on the medical side of that? What's the energy? Uh, how are the athletes feeling? All that stuff. Bring us in. It's amazing. Um, the last two games have been different and more challenging for, you know, all the reasons COVID related and just the world itself. But if I took it back to the games before that, it's an amazing atmosphere. Um, when you fly in and usually our medical team becomes staggered in based off of, you know, we're there for a month or so or 30 to 45 days. And some people got to get in early wow. and set up the clinics and, and do things that are um, on the front end and behind the scenes to get the state, like set the stage ready. I mean, Team USA has a games division. that's not medicine based, but are, there are people that are on the ground and the, the quad before they're planning all these things so that when the athletes show up, they don't even know um, the stuff that went behind the scenes, but they're there and it's, it's dialed in for them as best that it can be based off the, the restrictions that are there. Um, but as far as medically, we have teams that come in earlier. We have a whole team that ships over equipment. Um, when it comes to, we bring an entire clinic system with us. So if I, before we even get to the games, we have an entire team that is loading pallets, uh, whether those be, you know, products that are for recovery, whether they be, um, tables and things. So we go to Olympic games. It looks very similar to our training rooms or our, our clinic specifically at all of our training centers. Um, we have, you know, multiple tables that are there. We have instrument assisted stop tissue technique, like, uh, instruments that are there. We have from myofascial decompression to grass and whatever tool you want for instrument assisted. Plus, um, we have, you know, it, it looks like a clinic. Um, sure. We have multiple rooms. It looks like a clinic. And so it's set up on the front end. And then as our team starts to come through, we're usually there before athletes start to show up so we can, you know, prep the rest of those pieces and just be, you know, climatized and ready for them as best that we can. And as soon as the athletes get on site and even before that, you just feel this energy because it's such a cool event. And from a team USA perspective, like we have so many people on the ground and so many people that um, over the years have become really close friends that I don't see other than sometimes every four years and with zoom. Now we see them a lot more. Um, but just the atmosphere, the willingness to do anything, um, in and outside of your scope. Right. And I say that in a medical field, we stay within our scope, but we may be lugging bags. We may be doing a lot of the grunt work, you know, cleaning things off that aren't even attached to medicine, just because we only have a certain number of people in country, mm. you know, to support team USA. And if it's a summer games, it's 500 athletes. But the delegation's huge, and we bring a medical team that's you know, fifteen deep. Fifteen. I mean, that's just Team USA medical, oh, right? But yeah, for five hundred, we may have like fifty total medicine. I don't know the number specifically, and I could probably get better numbers if I just would have looked it up ahead of time. Um, but we have, you know, the numbers are low for medicine. Partly that's just credentials. There's not enough credentials to get, you know coaches, administrative staff for this particular sports and medical in there. And then we bring a medical team that is going to help those teams out and work and partner with them to just take care of team USA athletes in any capacity needed. And at the same time, we're also, you know, running, you know, food to different areas and we have dietitians that are running stuff. It's just a team of, you know, everyone's moving for the right direction and people are picking up the pieces as best we can. Um, cause we're thin, we're thin as a, um, as a support team and that includes medicine as well. Is it stressful? But, like 30, 45 days straight? Like, are you sleeping much? Like how crazy is it? It really depends. I mean, it's, it is, they're, they're crazy hours, right? We work great. We work crazy hours in medicine in general, right? If you have a prior practice or you work for a hospital or you're in a clinic setting, that's, you know, I mean, the hours are always, we didn't get into it because the hours are great. Um, we got into love sport and we love, we love taking care of people. And we love managing care. Um, and so those hours are only challenging towards the end. Um, when everyone's just, you know, you've done 30 straight days of the same thing, uh, over and over and you're picking the pieces up and you still have a smile on your face and you're still ready to, cause you know, someone's competing that day that just got in four days ago, but yeah, you've been there for 35 days. So it's not about you at that point. And so you got to kind of continue to check that each morning. It does become challenging to, uh, the monotony of it at times and not to say that in a bad way, but yeah. it does become challenging because you're away from your family you're away from other pieces. And that's just, you know, it's a sacrifice we make. Uh, and it's because we're there for the, the, the greater good of that team or those people we're helping, you know, whether they make the stage or not, whether they make the finals of that event or, uh, they PR, whatever it is, we're here for them. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what's so rewarding, which kind of gets you up out of bed each day. And so the hours are extremely long. Usually it's something like seven o'clock. We're doing a team rounds of things that are happening on the day and what happened. Cause we're always learning things during a game's process, whether it be from a, um, busing schedule to, to doping, to all these things. I mean, things are constantly evolving. So we have a team communication in the morning and it, you know, picks up from there. And then you may not go to bed until 10 30, 11 at night. We try to stagger, we try to get people time that are, that are needing it, but everyone's picking up the load. Yeah. But at the same time, it is fun as hell. And it is so rewarding to watch, you know, that, um, you know, someone compete really well. Maybe they do really well and they, and they medal or if they, they PR it again or they, something happened. It's ex- so, so cool yeah. uh, to watch just you having a little piece of that. Maybe you help them get through a point because they were stuck in a certain area. They had an ankle injury as they're training, whatever it might be. Um, super cool. And it's always rewarding to watch, you know, the flag lifted up high. Everyone stands up. We celebrate, you know, when the anthem's going off and it's as if we're, we're there, even though we're in a clinic area, that's just, you know, adjacent to the stadium or venue that's happening. It's just super, super cool. Are you able to watch the events? Are you at uh, the field or the stadium or whatever, or are you in your training center the whole time? Uh, it's a mixture of both. Um, we have the opportunity. Sometimes we're going to be on the field of play. Um, and I say field of play loosely, but we're going to be with the team on the sidelines and we're going to do things like that because medicine can do that. Some of our team may do it more of the NGB. So that sports specific medical team might be there, um, but things happen. And if you use a winter games experience where an athlete goes down, you know, we might have to put somebody into place uh, to backfill for them. And so it's a big, it's a mixture of both where you get a chance to be out of venues and, you know, support teams that are there. If you're with an NGB, absolutely. You're doing that. Uh, if you are uh, part of team USA medical, it's, you know, maybe less likely you're going to be specifically ID to that because the teams are bringing their medical staff to them or we're going to liaise with them and see whatever they need and backfill them wherever it is. And so it's a, you know, it's a team approach. And I think that's why we wear so many hats in our clinics currently is that we can, we can do skills from taping mobilization, you know, emergency medicine, all of our team can do those pieces. So we can fill in in a pinch and, and be a supportive um, supportive partner there for the NGBs who are really running medical um, for those things. But yes, you do get to witness sport. You get to be in the clinic there. We have a high performance training center where we have athletes training. And so it's a mixture of all those things. And um, some days you might be out, you know, event side, other days you might be um, in the clinic. We try to keep it rotating a little bit. So there's, you know, some new pieces to it, but at the same time we're there for the team that's, that's there, the medical staff that's supporting that team. Um, that capacity and it's it's not about watching events and sometimes it's you may catch it on tv or yeah. hear the result afterwards because you're, you're tied into something else yeah sure sure yeah. it's unique i don't know i don't know how to explain it yeah it's, it's really unique yeah. yeah and then so the last two olympic games have been with covid going on at the same time right so how has that been for you guys what was the level of anxiety of passing around the virus like what what kind of stuff was going through your head for me personally, it was, I mean, I've been to a number of games. Obviously, the the games around COVID were were different in, in the testing protocols, the things that are going into there. I never really let it enter my mind because there's so many protocols you have to do daily and the testing that has to happen that there's a chance for spreading virus. I think in the early phases, you think about it because you're kind of getting into a, a I hate saying a bubble because it's never really, you know, a bubble. Um, but you're getting into the, the testing area where you're kind of with others that are tested. And so it never really crossed my mind too much about like that being a big issue at the time. It's just a matter of like, how can we make sure we don't, we are, if we do, if we are sick, we're not going to spread it to an athlete. We're not going to make sure we take it away from somebody else. That's the, that's the one piece where you had, you know, we made sure we stay really rigid with our protocols and the things that we're doing. Um, I never really, really get into my mind at all, but I've mm-hmm. been to a number of games. So I wasn't really, <laughs> no matter what the situation was, even though we never been around COVID, it's still not going to change the way I really function yeah. uh, from a medical perspective. Cause we're going to try and do all we can to make sure we prevent anything from occurring. Sure. And then do, do the volunteers, do volunteers with team USA get to go over and work medical and that type of thing? Is yes. that a lure to the volunteer? It, it is. And it's, so it's a big part. So we, we do bring volunteers from um, a lot of different disciplines when it comes to the medical back, like the medical field. Like there's a number of our staff that do travel, but we have multiple games to staff, right? So we have Olympic games that are Paralympic games that maybe some are related. And we had Pan American games the year before that. So our team gets to integrate as far as like going to those events and, and being a part of the medical staff for those teams. We're invited to those things just like volunteers are. 
Um, and so we truly staff, not just our own medical team, but also the volunteers that come through because there's so many great providers around. We're fortunate in that aspect. And so we, we do typically bring, um, a large number of our staff are a part of it because we're in and out of the teams on a daily basis. And we know the inner workings of just Olympic sport in general. Um, and then we do have a big contingency that are volunteers that come through and then maybe a, you know, a volunteer physician, internal med physician, depends on really what the diversity of our team needs to be orthopedic surgeon, whatever, you know, what other skills they offer and things. And so our team is very diverse. Sure. Sure. And then, so if, uh, if, uh, uh, DC or a PT or an AT wanted to volunteer with you guys. What is that process like? Uh, there's a volunteer network they can they can join. So there's if you went to Team USA's website, there's a uh, medical and there's a volunteer tab and there's a couple requirements that you know everyone must meet as far as safe sport, USADA background, USADA background checks, minimum years in practice with a sport specialty or something of that sort. And once you've completed or you meet that criteria, you can apply for a uh, volunteer. And then as long as they've listened to this podcast, that is a guarantee that they'll get entered in and accepted, correct? <laughs> oh, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> well, at no, least be a foot in the door for Kevin. Okay. But it gives it gives people to put their interest, uh, you know, what training center they might want to they might want to go to or um, what sports they want to be involved with, uh, the timing in which they're we're looking for volunteers too, right? We try and staff them where there's heavy need of our teams or maybe traveling somewhere. So we have a lot of staff that are out, but we have a, a big volume of camps and athletes coming in. Um, and then there's three different locations they can, you know, essentially choose from based off of what's available and what's needed. And so it's, if there's a team that works through that process and looks at what we're looking at as far as like, maybe we're back, but we're, we're going to lose two PTs, um, I say lose them because they're going to go travel with the team somewhere and, you know, they're going to be out of the clinic. And so we don't have a PT specific PT skill set in there. We would try and backfill for a PT uh, one or two, depending on how many are leaving. Same for an AT, same for a DC. Um, so that we have our entire team is still the makeup is interdisciplinary. Very good. Very good. Yeah. And then, so if you're an athlete with team USA, are you on the payroll of, of USA? Is it like a full-time job? Do athletes have other jobs? Like you said, like kind of like the dorm environment where they eat, sleep, and breathe Team USA in their sport. Uh, does that make them like an employee? How, how are the dynamics of that? So they're working with the NGB specifically. And so they may be contracted with the NGB. I think each team has inner workings of how they, you know, prioritize or how they fund um, their cohort of tiers of athletes. And they have different criteria. And so we don't touch base on that. And so medicine's yeah. really never involved in it. Um the teams may do that more specifically and those NGBs specifically lay out those guidelines of who's a resident, right? Who is funded. They're all probably on a contractor as I would imagine. So there's some kind of contract they're signing that's specific to that NGB. Gotcha. But as far as Team USA funding and they're funded by Team USA. Like it's, it gets a little more trickier than that, but it's usually the NGB that's funding them. Sure, sure. There are services that they're offered, you know, from Team USA, whether it be medical at a training center or, insurance and uh, mental health resources and sports psychology and other pieces of that sort. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very good. Um, just curious. Then let's talk about injuries, the neck. That's an area of interest to me. Um, what sports do you guys work with where neck and concussion injuries are most common? We look at the broad side. I mean, it's probably any athlete that comes to a training center is going to have some capacity. And I say that because it's not going to be your, I mean, it's going to be, I know you had, you've had Bobby on the podcast, right. And you've had, you know, with rugby specifically speaking on a number of like neck injuries and things in, in contact sports. Uh, but I really think it happens in it happens in the majority of any sport and it may not be more sport specific. It could happen in a, in a gym training session or something else doing an Olympic complex move movement if they had to, and they're snatching overhead or whatever it might be. And you can, you can tweak a neck or they're an overhead athlete that we know the neck is heavily involved in the shoulder and mechanics and things that tie in between those pieces. So I think any sport can have it. And I say really any sport because archers have neck pain. Like mm. everybody has neck pain in some capacity, it's just a matter of the mechanism that caused it. And so um, we manage a ton of neck pain uh, and in a variety of, you know, whether it be just acute soft tissue, you know, discogenic symptoms with neuro symptoms or without neuro or ridiculous. So, I mean, we deal with all of the sorts. Um, it's not just the contact sports that, you know, maybe people think of initially when it comes to neck pain. And I think if you talk to a chiropractor or someone says, oh, you're a chiropractor, think, oh, my neck or my back or, you know, whatever it is, like 
sure we'll manage a lot of those pieces, but yeah, um, yeah really any sport has it. A lot of it's soft tissue based, a lot of it's neuromechanical um, or it's motion restricted and things of that sort. So we do a ton of soft tissue from a variety of levels of soft tissue, a lot of mobilization with movement and things of that sort. And then it really gets into the rehab side of things. Like we can do all we want with, you know, you know, calming tissue down and being really like soft and loosening tissue, but for a postural area, um, the stability is, is, you know, most important. So you can do whatever you want as far as soft tissue mobility. If you don't load the tissue afterwards, then it's probably not going to stay or you're going to, you know, you're going to repeat that same cycle and over and over again, if they're a repetitive sport. And that's why I say archery, looking one direction, pulling a bow, you know, they're, they have a lot of asymmetry. And so there's a lot of asymmetry in the next ball. What strategies do you guys use to to load the neck after doing your soft tissue or whatever? I mean, I think a lot of it varies based off practitioner and, and the the skills that are there. And we have your devices in, in two of our clinics now. So we definitely use that from a lot of perspective of loading. I think the I think it really depends on, you know, what is their what does their strength program look like and what things are they doing already in that and how do we complement that in the how do we how do we change that maybe in some capacity? How do we complement it in another um, another area. And I think it's a variety of things that we do. It's going to be a lot of postural things. It's going to be a lot of time under tension, isometrics. Um, and then you start getting into some motion, pain-free motion, you know, you can use mobilization with movement while doing some loaded exercise and other pieces. And so I think it's going to be a variety of those, um, you know, pain, long as pain is out of the way, or some sort of pain-free range of motion, you can start working through those things. And we know ultimately, um, you minimize pain in general and then the motion starts to come back and you start strengthening things and it starts to maintain. And so it's going to be a mixture of isometrics. It's going to be a mixture of, you know, loaded movements with, you know, flexion, extension, rotation. It's going to be isometrics and they're not in those orders, but it's going to be all those pieces. And then we, and I know Bobby mentioned this before, like there still is some people that do old school neck stuff, right? Whether <laughs> it's minimal and there's probably little, there's probably less that are doing it, but there's still iron neck. There's still a bunch of other pieces that are out there that people are using. Um, Personally, I think I go for like a postural time under tension loading isometrics as an early phase and then start getting into some more dynamic movements. We might apply some mobilization with movement type of techniques under load. I think your device itself is a really easy way to do that. Um, and it's been nice to kind of, you know, experiment and play with it a bit. Yeah. So probably about what, 10 hours or so on the next level per patient with neck pain, I would guess, right? 14, 15 hours. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, yeah. I, I was curious if you, thought. sorry, go ahead. I was getting a couple of that thought. I think that you can, I mean, it's going to be loading tissue specifically to that because it complements other movements. Right. And so how much of the neck is involved in something that's maybe not under tension there and, and involved with, you know, a three-way pull and an Olympic complex and the other things you can educate athletes on as far as like how the neck strengthening is built into a large portion of their strength program right. and something else to, just to complement that a little more because it's going to go back into their training program. Do you mind if we talk about the field of chiropractic for a second? Of course. So to my understanding, um, a lot of chiropractors think about alignment and adjustments changing or uh, modifying spinal alignment. Um, is that a fair, so is that fair? You could, oh, I mean, you could say that. Do I subscribe to that? That'd be the other question, but yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm working there. I'm working there. So, uh, so yeah, so perhaps, you know, some chiropractors will, will be focused on alignment and then they'll do manipulations to hopefully improve alignment. Was that how you were taught? And then how did, how has your opinion on spine and manipulations changed over the years? Um, it might've been some of the training that was brought into like the, you know, if it's a four year program, first year stuff, and you're looking at alignment, um, never at that time did I really subscribe to that anyways. Uh, mm -hmm. I never thought that was something that I was always going to try and correct from a postural perspective, whether it be any part of the spine. Um, I think just not enough to support it and that, that made sense to me, um, I still think that's probably true. There's not enough to support that specifically. And I think early on when you're going through and you're, you know, you're going through chiropractic school and you start manipulating and do much things, there's a lot of relief that comes from it. Um, I mean, maybe it's why I got into chiropractic early on other than PT or, you know, actually going to med school. Um, but 
there's a lot of relief that comes in some capacity, understanding why that happens and how, what, you know, why you use it versus something else. Um, I think I've moved and shifted over the years where, you know, I never was very, uh, never really believed in manipulation being the primary source. I always thought movement and, and quality of movement were big pieces to, um, you know, fixing a number of ailments that might be some of the background of how I had PT in my years growing up. Um, but I never really subscribed to just manipulation fix everything. There are some that still hold their head on that. Not a big um, believer in those pieces. I think movement is most important. I today probably practice, probably don't manipulate a lot of people in general. And I know there's, if there's chiropractors listening, they're going to be kind of maybe, oh, you're, you're just due to the service to our, to our profession, but I, I mobilize a ton more and that's a variety of things. And if you think about it from like a high velocity low to thrust versus like I can get into tissue and I can move things and it's a, a version of that, or you can do pain-free motion, that, motion that's active. Um, I'm kind of more on that side where I use a lot of mobility, their own quality of movement, facilitated movement. So it's, you know, it's mobilization with movement techniques that I prefer to do within my soft tissue. Um, if that isn't cleared up, then maybe I look to adjust, but it's always the last piece of how I particularly, you know, manage care and treat when it comes to mobilize versus manipulate. Um, it's not diff it's, it's gone more that direction. The more I've been in practice, um, Early on, I probably would have adjusted and said, I'll do soft tissue afterwards. And that was just some of the training that we were having at the time. But I've always been very soft tissue based, very mobility based, and then manipulate uh, afterwards. And I think with that said, it's always like, what's the what's the rationale? What's the risk reward? And I think about that even more in practice now. Like, why would I address through somebody's cervical spine or their rib if they're still guarding in some capacity? Like, is that really worth the risk that they could flare up and miss two training days or more? Because I thought it was, you know, the right move to do that because that's what's in my initial bag of tricks that I've, you know, my initial schooling. So I don't know if that answers your question fully, but I've kind yeah. of moved toward the mobility side, mobilization, manipulate if it's really, really needed and, and what's the risk reward there. Yeah, very good. Uh, that that definitely answers my question. And as, as we wrap up here, we, we kind of discussed it, but obviously students or younger clinicians can volunteer with Team USA. Uh, but specifically, if you were just talking to a student uh, and they wanted to you know, do something like you, what advice do you have to them as they move through their career? Yeah, I think getting exposed to a number of different providers from different specialties as much as possible. I did a two-year residency following after, after I finished my doctorate in chiropractic. I did a two-year residency in sport after that, which was you know, probably... As I was going through school, I once said volunteer, volunteer, go shadow, go do things. And I did that. And I think you get a lot of perspective of, you know, maybe how you want, how you can influence your own practice. You can gain knowledge as far as the business mindset from the practicality of how they manage care to the office flow. There's so many things you can gain by just getting out there and volunteering your time and just shadowing people. And I'd say you have to do that. Um, the more you can volunteer at, if you want to be in sport, at sporting events, knowing that you're going to, you know, it's going to be on a weekend, it's going to be terrible hours, you're going to do grunt work, but being exposed to the areas, so you kind of know what you're getting in for. Um, and that appreciation that's there, you can't volunteer enough and to continue to build your resume in different avenues that are diverse. And so I mentioned my residency that opened up the doors for orthopedic side of things from the emergency medicine to PM&R to all the pieces of like, you know, outside of healthcare, way outside of a chiropractor scope of practice, but just having a better understanding for those pieces and working in imaging and radiology, like all that stuff molded me to, you know, the job I want to have today and to how I practice currently. Um, and so I think it's just a, we are an expression of everything we've been exposed to. And if we continue to expose ourselves to more and more, you know, good and bad practitioners, doesn't matter what it is, you're going to learn something. And if you take a pearl from any one of those people um, or those providers that are excellent, or, you know, maybe not as great as the others, uh, you're going to learn something that's going to mold you and you can't do that enough still do it today. I think we all probably do, still do it today. I mean, you've had great people on your podcast. I mean, you're, you're learning every time you speak with someone and engage with somebody, but anything you can take out of a conversation for someone who's been there, done it before, continue to do it. That's that good. So there. Sorry. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Volunteer, give your time, no, expe no expectation of getting paid, but then you may find yourself in a really cool job. Yeah, I think you got to be prepared for, you know, the unexpected. A lot of our staff and all these are experienced here. It's not because we, you know, have one credential behind our name and it's really not the credential. It's the person that we are. It's the skills that we offer. It's the experience. That's how we control ourselves as a team and how we become a team player. And the more you're exposed to things, the more you're going to, you know, appreciate those pieces and it'll, it'll open up doors for you. And then I think continue learning. 
continue to grow um, in your own profession, continue to grow outside of your profession. And if you don't know the answer, it's okay. Just continue to, you know, strive to know as much as you can before you need to know it. Yes. If you don't know the answer, it's okay. Especially if you're new to it. And especially if you admit that you don't know, as opposed to sliding that under the rug and then downstream looking like an idiot. That happens all the time. Good, good advice. Um, Kevin, are you a social media guy? Do you want people following you? If so, should they, where should they find you? So I have, I was a social media person. If you would have asked me, I don't know how many years it's been. I haven't been on social media in a long time. Uh, you can find me on social media. Do I go <laughs> on? I <don't. laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really. Yeah, I've never. I've moved away from social media in general. And do I say that I stay away from it in all avenues? No. But as far as Instagram, I mean, I have an Instagram. I have a LinkedIn. I have other pieces. Um, I don't typically use them at this moment. And maybe it's because my current role and job that I have doesn't really doesn't really need that I would say. And, and the time spent there. So yeah, you can find me at any one of those. Um, if you do and you ping me on LinkedIn or something else, I'd be happy to reply or see how I can help somebody. But um, thanks for the ask. Uh, it's not something I truly mess with too much lately. Yeah. So uh, for the audience out there, if you want more of Kevin, you will just need to listen to this podcast again. Okay. So, <laughs> Kevin, thanks for your time today. It was a real pleasure. Scott, appreciate you having me. Hopefully some of the stuff can be shared. Uh, but yeah, thanks for your time today and thanks for having me.